Okay, I believe we can start. Uh, hello, everybody. I am Roger Waldinger, Professor of Sociology at UCLA, Director of the Center for the Study of International Migration, and I am delighted to welcome you to our continuing session of uh, book talks on migration. Uh, today, we will discuss a new book by Yossi Harpaz, Assistant Professor of Sociology at Tel Aviv University, Citizenship 2.0, Dual Nationality as a Global Asset, with a comment by Rogers Brubaker, Professor of Sociology, UCLA. Uh, let me make sure to emphasize that this is an ongoing joint activity of uh, the uh, CSIM at UCLA and the Center for Comparative Immigration Studies at UC San Diego. And then we will meet again, same time, same place, so to speak, next Friday for a discussion of a book by Shoba Wadhia, Banned Immigration Enforcement in the Time of Trump. So I'm going to give the floor over to Yossi, who will speak for roughly 20 minutes. Uh, he'll be followed by a comment from Rogers. The floor will go back to Yossi, and then we will open up, and you can use the hands raised function to, uh, if you wish to, ask a question. Okay, so Yossi, the floor is yours. Okay, so um, thank you. It's, thank you, Roger, and uh, thanks, uh, David, for, uh, and Sophia for making this happen, and thanks, uh, Rogers, for. Uh, being a discussant. Can you see the, uh, my video? My, sorry. Sorry, just a second. Is it sharing? No. Is it sharing my slideshow right now? Sophia? No, it isn't. It isn't. Shit, sorry. Sorry, just a second. Why isn't it showing? It says to double click to enter the full screen mode. Oh, okay. Can you see it's it working. More? It's working. Great. So uh, I'm, I'm very excited to, uh, to uh, speak with you. I'm speaking from uh, Tel Aviv. It's 10 p.m. here right now, and I'm going to be giving a brief presentation of my book and I'm really looking forward to uh, Roger's, uh, Roger's comments and to your uh, comments and uh, questions. So um, the, the book is uh, called the Citizenship 2.0, Dual Nationality as a Global Asset. Uh, and this book basically uh, starts with a legal change. So, sorry, just one second. So for, so, and the legal change is the uh, changing relation of countries to dual citizenship. For most of the 20th uh, century, countries did not permit their citizens to hold more than one uh, citizenship. And there were uh, international uh, treaties and uh, attempts by countries to prevent dual citizenship, uh, which was seen as a very problematic uh, status. Since the 1990s, this situation has been changing very uh, rapidly as dozens of countries changed the laws to permit dual citizenship. And uh, what you see in this graph here, the uh, light blue bar shows the percentage of countries in different world regions that permitted uh, dual nationality in 1990. The yellow bar is the percentage of countries in those regions in uh, uh, permitting dual citizenship in 2016. And what you see is a very dramatic uh, change from uh, uh, something that only 20, 30% of countries in different regions are permitted to um, a new global norm where uh, over 80% of countries in uh, Europe and the Americas uh, permit their citizens to hold dual citizenship. So this might look like a technical, even technical change, a small change that only affects a small number of people. But I became very uh, curious about this as I was uh, working on my dissertation research. I, this uh, book came out of my dissertation work at Princeton University uh, with Andres Wimmer as my main uh, advisor. And uh, I became curious about the implications of the rise of dual citizenship. Basically, what happens to the institution of national membership when the basic laws 
uh, change, when it changes from a status that is uh, exclusive, one uh, person can belong to only one uh, country or can have ties to only one country, to a situation where people can have ties to multiple uh, countries. Uh, so the question is, what are the uh, sociological, what are the, uh, the economic, what are the political implications, what are the implications on identity when citizenship changes from being an, ex from being an exclusive relationship to being uh, something that can be uh, collected and uh, accumulated. And I won't keep you in suspense and I'll tell you right away what is the main uh, thrust of my argument. And that is that once people can um, have more than one citizenship, they uh, begin to treat it in a much more strategic way. The uh, possibility to have multiple citizenships creates the uh, possibility of accumulating uh, citizenships even when uh, uh, one does not identify with the country of citizenship, even if one does not intend to emigrate to uh, that country. Uh, and um, citizenship becomes an asset. And um, this whole concept of citizenship as an asset uh, refers to the uh, differences in value between citizenship. So people would be motivated to acquire citizenship from uh, a country that is uh, of a uh, higher value than the citizenship that they already hold. So um, the, um, as I, um, during my research, as I collected more and more statistical data and interview data on, the, uh, on the, and the, the, the way people actually used dual citizenship and acquired dual citizenship, I uh, came to realize that global inequality in citizenship value is the main force that is driving a demand for citizenship and shaping the way people used it. And I built a model uh, that uh, divides the, the world's citizenship into three tiers of uh, value. And this is based purely on practical value. I'm not saying what is uh, good or uh, bad or moral or not moral, just describing the uh, practical usefulness of different nationalities to different people. And uh, I, I'm just showing the results of the model. I can explain in the q and if you're interested how I built it. Basically, the idea is that you have uh, four dimensions of citizenship, um, economic opportunities, uh, security, democracy, and travel freedom. And uh, when you um, uh, take into account these different dimensions, then you can uh, see how the world's countries are divided into the three tiers, the top tier of uh, Western European and North American countries, plus Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, uh, third tier, which includes most uh, Asian and African countries, and the middle tier of countries that are kind of in the middle of the global distribution. And this includes most uh, Eastern European countries, uh, Latin American countries, also Israel, the United Arab Emirates, uh, Malaysia, and several other countries. And basically, um, my, uh, my study of dual citizenship has focused on the, uh, on the middle tier. So the middle tier, when we're looking at strategic dual uh, citizenship, the middle tier is where the uh, action is, so to speak. And um, a lot of the literature has looked at the dual citizenship of immigrants living in Western countries, people who uh, immigrate to uh, Western Europe and North America. Uh, and uh, I chose to focus on and the overlooked phenomenon of dual citizenship in those middle tier countries, which is acquired with the express purpose of holding a second citizenship. It is not a byproduct of immigration. People deliberately and strategically try to get a second citizenship. So this is a phenomenon that shows uh, very clearly how people are um, strategizing their position within this uh, global hierarchy. And I call this uh, phenomenon compensatory citizenship. So compensatory citizenship is a uh, second citizenship from a Western or uh, EU country that is acquired by citizens of middle tier countries, so mostly in Latin America and uh, Eastern Europe. And um, they uh, acquire this kind of citizenship by drawing on existing ancestral or ethnic ties. So these are regions that are 
uh, historically and ethnically close to the uh, to EU countries, uh, and uh, either were part of uh, European empires or were settled by Europeans, or people can also um, actively create this kind of ties through migra migration and uh, birth. And when we look at dual citizenship in that context, we find very high demand for dual citizenship that is driven by very instrumental motivations. That is uh, divorced from the traditional assumptions of citizenship as identity uh, and citizenship as um, intention to reside in the country. And I call it compensatory citizenship because the, the, the secondary citizenship so the uh, European citizenship that is acquired, let's say Italian citizenship that is acquired by an Argentinian or Hungarian citizenship that is acquired by a, a Serbian or a Ukrainian or an Israeli who acquires German citizenship. This a second citizenship is not necessarily intended to replace the original citizenship in the way that we usually think about and when we think about immigration, but uh, it, it, it is intended to make up for some of the citizenship deficits in the country of residence, to uh, provide more security, to provide a better passport, to provide, to provide uh, broader opportunities. And uh, in my study, I, I try to cover the three main pathways to compensatory citizenship. So these are not the only pathways, but these are the demographically most significant uh, pathways to this kind of dual citizenship. So the first one uh, draws on ancestry. You have European countries that are uh, historical centers of migration, like uh, Italy and Spain, that um, allow um, the descendants of immigrants to reacquire citizenship. And these can be people whose uh, ancestors left Italy uh, 100 uh, years ago, 120 years ago, and uh, they can still reacquire Italian citizenship. And there has been strong demand for this ancestry-based citizenship, especially in South America, where you have more than two and a half million uh, EU people who acquired Italian or Spanish or Portuguese uh, dual citizenship based on ancestry. Also uh, in Israel, people have acquired German or Polish citizenship based on ancestry. A second pathway is uh, ethnicity. Uh, and you have countries like uh, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria offering uh, dual citizenship to non-residents based on ethnicity. Uh, so they also require that people demonstrate their ethnic identity or their uh, language skills in order to get the citizenship. And you have more than 600,000 people who acquire uh, this uh, um, citizenship from EU countries in countries that are outside the EU. And a third uh, pathway and very interesting one is a strategic birth. And this pertains specifically to uh, countries with uh, youth solely so a uh, right of soil citizenship where birth into territory automatically uh, uh, guarantees citizenship. So we're talking about mostly about the US, also uh, Canada. Um, and this involves people coming in from other countries, giving birth uh, in the US and then uh, going back to their uh, countries. And there have been uh, over 140,000 uh, strategic US dual citizens in Mexico. Uh, this is the case I studied and many more in uh, China, Turkey, and other uh, countries. And there have been a number of scholars that have been doing uh, work on that. So these are the general contours of this uh, phenomenon, the three largest pathways. There are other pathways to compensatory citizenship. Maybe the most interesting one is citizenship by investment, but uh, which is just, just means uh, paying some of uh, uh, money and uh, getting citizenship. But I, I focus on these three. And I took a representative uh, study cases that uh, represent each of these three pathways. So I studied EU citizenship uh, in Israel. Uh, so this is citizenship that is acquired by people whose uh, parents and grandparents left Europe uh, in the um, 30s, 40s, 50s, and are now uh, reacquiring this citizenship. I looked at Hungarian citizenship in Serbia, or Hungary is in the EU and Serbia is not, and there is an ethnic Hungarian minority in Serbia, and I looked at US citizenship in Mexico. Now, originally in the abstract, I said I was gonna focus on the Mexican case, but uh, I, they told me I have to make the presentation 20 minutes, so I'm not gonna focus on any case. I'm gonna give uh, a panorama, I have uh, eight minutes left, so I'm gonna give it very briefly. I'm gonna say um, 
a little bit about the commonalities between the cases. And the, uh, what I found was that in spite of the huge differences between the, in these countries in terms of geography, three continents, history, culture, the different pathways that produce uh, eligibility for dual citizenship, we see a lot of commonality between those cases. So I'm gonna be talking very briefly about some of these uh, common features uh, in the way that people acquire citizenship, in the way that people use citizenship, and in the meaning of dual citizenship. Just um, something about this photo that you have here, uh, the guy with the mustard colored uh, tie that is second from the left. Um, some of you may recognize him. This is Viktor Orban, the uh, prime minister of Hungary. And uh, the guy holding a baby in his arms is the one million Hungarian citizen that was created on the basis of uh, a law that was initiated by Orban to uh, provide dual citizenship to ethnic uh, Hungarians living outside Hungary. So this is celebrated uh, in Budapest. And so uh, you see here that the, uh, the government is very actively, in Hungary, is very actively uh, promoting this kind of dual citizenship. So something about the, the similarities between the, uh, the cases. About acquisition, the, uh, the common theme that I found across these cases is commodification of citizenship. So once uh, dual citizenship becomes available, there, are, um, um, th there is a growing uh, tendency of people to treat it as, um, uh, as an asset. And there, uh, there is um, uh, always a kind of um, um, small industry of uh, service providers that provide uh, citizenship related services and they have a strong motivation to actually reframe citizenship as a marketable good and to uh, promote its acquisition. So what you see above is, a, is an ad that uh, promotes uh, giving birth in the US to uh, Latinos, this is in El Paso. Uh, and um, it says, uh, the, the text on the right, bottom right there says, uh, so give your baby the opportunity to live a better life. So this is part of the benefits of giving birth uh, in the US. Uh, what you see uh, below, so um, is a um, Hungarian. Uh, so there have been uh, doctors and clinics that have been promoting uh, strategic birth in the U.S. I did not actually, uh, I did not manage to contact these clinics directly. I interviewed people who are acquiring citizenship uh, for their children in this way, and I can talk about it more in the Q&A. Uh, the second uh, photo shows a Hungarian language uh, class in Serbia. So basically the uh, Hungarian citizenship uh, in Serbia was intended only for ethnic Hungarians who could speak Hungarian, but uh, because Hungary is an EU country and Serbia is not, you have thousands of ethnic Serbs who actually embarked on studying Hungarian, which is considered one of the most uh, difficult languages in the world in order to be eligible for EU citizenship uh, and get this uh, passport. And this is a really striking uh, example. I took this photo in a, uh, in a mall in central Tel Aviv. And the sign says, you too deserve a European passport. And this was set up by a law office that is promoting Portuguese citizenship. So, um, and trying to get people to apply for citizenship. So here really uh, citizenship is being reframed by these uh, providers as uh, a good that is actually sold in the mall. So uh, this is one uh, pattern that we see, the uh, marketing of citizenship as a kind of commodity. About the uses, there have been a lot of diverse uses and I uh, cannot discuss them with any detail here, but then what I'm gonna say very briefly is that the uses of dual citizenship uh, are not necessarily conditioned on being resident in the country of citizenship. So apparently, um, there are many ways in which citizenship can be useful even if you don't live in the country of citizenship and um, some of the most prominent ways are first of all as an insurance policy and this was very prominent in the um, in the Israeli case and in the uh, uh, in the Mexican case where people 
uh, felt that they had uh, better, uh, they had this option with the European uh, passport or with a US citizenship. A second uh, use of citizenship is to increase global mobility. Uh, a European passport uh, allows better mobility and better mobility across borders also functions as a kind of uh, status symbol. Um, and um, finally, I'm going through this very quickly. Uh, I'd be happy to elaborate more in the Q&A. Uh, finally, the um, availability of uh, dual citizenship creates a kind of uh, revaluation of uh, values and changes the meaning of citizenship. I mean, changes the meaning of citizenship or maybe you could say it is reflective of the change that has already happened, uh, but, but it says something about the way people perceive citizenship. And here I wanna uh, state right away that the percentage of people who actually hold dual citizenship is small. We're talking about 2% uh, in a global sample that I had, 10% uh, in a country like Israel, which is the, the country with highest prevalence of dual citizenship. So this is a small part of the population, but the kind of uh, attitudes that they express are indicative of a larger pattern, especially because they are allowed by law and they're not uh, subject to a lot of uh, criticism. So um, in some of these, in, in all three of these cases, we see a change in the meaning of uh, dual citizenship from something that is uh, abominable and problematic and stigmatized to something, something that is seen in a positive way, even cool. So the, maybe the most extreme example is that of uh, German citizenship in Israel. So for uh, in several decades after the Holocaust, uh, requiring German citizenship for German origin Jews was seen as an abomination, as an outrage. Today, the German passport is not only legitimate, but it's actually considered something very cool to have and a status symbol. Uh, more broadly, the kind of uh, attitudes that I uh, found in my uh, interviews was um, a view of citizenship as property. So people were discussing citizenship with um, terms and metaphors that are drawn from the world of property. This is especially true for Mexico and Israel. It's a little different in the Serbian case, but especially in, in Mexico and Israel, uh, we see in Israel people talking about the European citizenship as restitution, right? So uh, as a kind of property restitution, uh, we see in Israel and in Mexico, people talking about citizenship as a gift. So Mexicans invest $20,000 in giving birth in the US because they want to provide it as a gift to the children. They will not benefit from it themselves. People compare the second citizenship, the US or EU citizenship to a luxury product. Uh, and people talk about it as a kind of investment in the future. So overall, the kind of uh, attitude is something that I call the sovereign individual. So uh, the idea is that um, people, the people that I interviewed, and this may be indicative of a broader pattern, uh, see it as a, see the, the realm of citizenship and national membership as a legitimate domain for maximizing utility. They felt that it was their right to decide uh, and pick the citizenship that would be the most beneficial uh, to them. And uh, to conclude, what I um, what I find in general is a change in the meaning of citizenship from an ascribed status, something that one is born with and, and is fixed throughout the uh, individual's uh, life or can only be changed with great difficulty into an achieved status that is flexible, that can be uh, uh, changed uh, during the individual's uh, lifetime through their uh, striving. Uh, second point, I, uh, we see uh, states strategically recruiting citizens without requiring residence or exclusive link. I did not talk about the state perspective here, but I can talk about it in the Q&A. And in the individual perspective, we see two uh, interesting uh, uh, things. First of all, that people increasingly see citizenship, not just in terms of uh, a, uh, an individual dyadic relationship, sorry, a, a dyadic relationship with their nation where they belong, but also as position within a global uh, uh, ranking that uh, if given the opportunity, they can try and upgrade the, the position. And the second point is that, um, and this is derived from the first point, that people uh, treat their second citizenship instrumentally. This is seen as an asset, not necessarily an indicator of uh, identity. So um, the basic point is that 
the permission, the toleration of dual citizenship is creating an opportunity for people to treat citizenship in a more strategic and instrumental way. Uh, and I will uh, stop here. Thank you. Okay. Okay, terrific. Um, so I'm going to turn the uh, floor over to uh, Rogers Brubaker for a comment. All right, um, thank you very much, Roger and Yossi. In recent years, a small but growing literature has developed a global perspective on citizenship as an instrument of social closure that undergirds massive global inequalities in life chances. In global perspective, citizenship functions as an immense system of social classification that assigns people to polities based on the morally arbitrary accidents of birth. As such, it binds the vast majority of the world's population to the state to which they were initially assigned at birth. So while we often think of our world as characterized by unprecedented transborder mobility, in fact, only about 3% of the world's population live outside the country of their birth, and fewer than half of these are South North migrants. This is a large number in absolute terms, and it's obviously large enough to generate a massive political reaction in many countries, but it's a very small number in relation to the number of those who would seek work, well-being, or security in prosperous and peaceful countries if they were free to do so, but who are routinely and for the most part invisibly excluded simply by virtue of their nationality or citizenship. Now this perspective on citizenship as social closure and on the vast differences in the value of the world's citizenships in terms of the security, rights, economic opportunities, and mobility opportunities they provide is one of the starting points of Yossi's book. The other starting point is the increasingly relaxed attitude of states towards dual citizenship in recent decades, and in connection with this, the specific initiatives undertaken by a number of states to make citizenship available to certain trans-border populations with specific historical connections to the state. These factors together have created a new opportunity structure and Yossi shows in rich and consistently interesting detail how differently positioned groups have responded to this opportunity structure. Yossi's case studies are rich and interesting precisely because they bring into focus a range of complexities and ambiguities. These complexities stand in a certain tension, I think, with the overall argument of the book, which characterizes the acquisition of transborder citizenship as a strategy of global upward mobility. So I want to focus my comments on this tension, which comes out most clearly in his discussion of elite Mexicans and Israeli Ashkenazim. But before I discuss these case studies, I want to push Yossi a little bit on the evidence that he marshals in his theoretical chapter in support of his general argument that the demand for non-resident dual citizenship in EU countries is driven by practical and instrumental rather than identitarian and sentimental concerns. Yossi argues that this holds both where citizenship is offered to transborder coethnics, as in the Hungarian case, and where citizenship is offered to descendants of immigrants, as in Italy and Spain. I think the argument is basically sound, and I think it's supported with good data, but I think it's also overstated, at least in the Hungarian case. Yossi notes that the share of transborder Hungarian speakers acquiring Hungarian citizenship is extremely high in Ukraine and Serbia, where EU citizenship opens the door to valuable work and resettlement opportunities. And it's extremely low in North America. And this is clear and strong support for his instrumental argument. But demand is also quite high in Romania. As of 2018, 40% of the Hungarian speaking population had applied for Hungarian citizenship versus less than 2% in North America. It's true that the flat fraction of those applying is even higher in Serbia, about 60% as of 2018, but the Serbian figure is at least somewhat inflated by the fact that, as Yossi shows in his case study, a non-trivial number of people who were not counted as Hungarian speakers in the census have been studying Serb Hungarian in order to apply for citizenship. 
The high demand for Hungarian citizenship in Romania poses a challenge for Yossi's instrumentalist argument. Romania has been an EU member since 20, 2007, so the material incentives for acquiring Hungarian citizenship have been minimal. Now it's true, as Yossi points out, that certain transitional restrictions on full labor market access for Romanians were not lifted until 2014. But many prosperous EU countries opened their labor markets to Romanians well before then, and migration from Romania to EU destinations grew much more rapidly before 2014, when the transitional restrictions were still in place, than after 2014. Additional evidence suggesting minimal material incentives for applicants from Romania comes from a qualitative study that Yossi himself cites. The study was based on interviews with people who had gained non-resident Hungarian citizenship in Serbia and Romania, as well as other countries, and it found that pragmatic concerns were indeed utterly central and openly acknowledged in Serbia. This is precisely what Yossi found as well. For these applicants, at least the younger ones among them, the opportunity to work or move abroad, of course not to Hungary, but to Germany or Sweden, for example, is crucial. And EU citizenship clearly compensates for the limitations of Serbian citizenship, precisely in line with Yossi's argument. But the Pogonyi study found that the pragmatic concerns were completely peripheral in Romania, where only a few of his interviewees mentioned any pragmatic benefits. So I'm not persuaded that the very strong interest in acquiring Hungarian citizenship on the part of transborder ethnic Hungarians in Romania can be accounted for by the pragmatic added value that Hungarian citizenship would bring over and above the EU citizenship benefits already provided by Romanian citizenship. And this case, this case matters because Romanian citizens account for 60% of all transborder applicants for Hungarian citizenship. So let me turn now to Yossi's very interesting case studies of the elite Mexicans who give birth in the US and Israeli Ashkenazim who seek EU citizenship. Is citizenship being pursued strategically in these cases? Undoubtedly. Do these cases involve efforts to diversify assets and ensure against political risks? Absolutely. But should we interpret the acquisition of transborder citizenship in these cases as a strategy of global upward mobility? This is the title of Yossi's uh, theoretical chapter. This seems to me less clear. The elite Mexicans Yossi discusses are already at the top of the social hierarchy. They already have intricate transnational ties <clears throat> with the US, as Yossi puts it, and they regularly visit the US for shopping and vacations, but they have no desire to move to the US. They can enjoy a better quality of life in Mexico where luxuries like personal services and personal servants and high quality services are much more affordable. And as Yossi himself underscores, giving birth in the US and I quote, is part of a broader pattern of border spanning status oriented consumption. It is a medium for performing and transmitting elite identity and values. Yes, for those who already have it, American citizenship can provide a safe haven from violence linked to drug cartels. But as Yossi emphasizes, the strategy of giving birth in the US yields no personal benefit to a parent who does not already hold US citizenship, at least not until the child turns 21 and can then, in principle, sponsor the parent for immigration purposes. Certainly, securing American citizenship for one's children has some potential practical value for the kids. They can study in the US without needing visas. They can work during their studies. They can enjoy the flexibility of living on either side of the border should they wish or need to do so. But for these well-off parents, strategically acquiring citizenship for one's children strikes me not as a strategy of upward mobility, but as a strategy of intergenerational class reproduction. It's a form of prudent asset stewardship for the elite, a strategy for transmitting their already privileged position to the next generation in a manner that seeks to ensure against uncertainties and political risks. As for Israelis, Yossi's own account emphasizes the importance of non-economic, non-practical motivations. 
Again, there's little interest in emigrating to an EU country, and where one does see a substantial migratory movement, notably to Berlin, it seems to involve less upward mobility than a desire among young creative types to enjoy the city's cosmopolitan cultural environment. As Yossi notes, European citizenship is seen by Israelis as cool, as a status symbol. Like American citizenship for elite Mexicans, EU citizenship can serve as an insurance policy against political risk for middle-class Israelis. But this again seems to me not so much about global upward mobility as it is about prudent asset management. It's a strategy conditioned on Yossi's account by a distinctive Jewish family habitus grounded in an acute sense of political vulnerability. Part of the irony here is that the insurance strategy operates in both directions, while a European passport may offer insurance against political risk to Israelis the availability of Israeli citizenship and the possibility of making Aliyah at any time offers insurance against political risk to Jews in Europe, especially to Jews in France, increasingly concerned about anti-Semitic attacks. The further irony, though this gets us away from Yossi's book, is that today's anti-immigrant and specifically anti-Muslim successor parties to Europe's historically anti-Semitic far-right parties have been assiduously courting the votes of Jews in recent years, along with those of gays and women, claiming that these parties are best positioned to protect their rights against the putative civilizational threat from a supposedly intrinsically illiberal, anti-Semitic, homophobic, and misogynist Islam. EU citizenship, of course, also facilitates travel and education abroad for Israelis, just as American citizenship does for Mexicans. But Israelis' conceptions of the potential uses and value of EU citizenship strike me as too vague and nonspecific to count as a project of upward mobility. And Yossi's own interview data point to a more status-marking strategy of distinction than to a project of upward mobility. One interviewee explicitly characterized the European passport, and I quote, as like a luxury article that you buy, a fine watch or a laptop computer, you will not use all of its features. Maybe you'll never, perhaps you will never use more than five or 10% of its capacities, but you are willing to pay extra for the potential. Now, all of this makes me wonder whether the acquisition of EU citizenship for Israelis is more about outward mobility than about upward mobility. Perhaps one could think of it as a device that permits young and already privileged Israeli Ashkenazim to escape more easily the physically and politically constricted space of Israel with its oppressive nationalism and to reclaim the kind of cosmopolitan identity and orientation that was so strongly stigmatized by Zionism. Outward rather than upward mobility seems to be critical also for the perhaps 300,000 Hong Kong residents who hold Canadian citizenship or the 3 million Hong Kong residents who hold the status of British nationals overseas, 350,000 of whom hold British national overseas passports. And if we were to end up facing the prospect of four more years of Trump, a prospect happily receding, I suspect that some already privileged Americans might develop a newfound interest in EU citizenship, again, as an instrument of outward rather than upward global mobility. Of course, Yossi's fundamental point remains valid. Namely, a second citizenship is a valuable resource and people respond to changing opportunity structures in pursuing it. But in cases where that resource is employed in the service of consolidating and protecting elite status, transmitting that status to the next generation and ensuring against risks and uncertainties, I'm not sure it's best described as a strategy of upward mobility. So I think there's a bit of a tension between the simple, straightforward story set forth in the theoretical chapter and the more complex stories that emerge um, in the three case-focused chapters. I don't see this as a problem. It's a sign, rather, of the richness of the book that it can't be so neatly encapsulated in a single short formulation. I've used up my time, so let me very quickly pose two concluding questions to Yossi. First, in his discussion of Mexico, Yossi contrasts the elite Northerners on whom he focuses with another set of dual nationals who were born and raised in the US to Mexican immigrant families from lower class and rural backgrounds, but who then returned to Mexico when their parents were deported or voluntarily returned. This group, 
he suggests, lacks the resources, the money, education, and connections to derive benefits from their status as dual nationals. I'm not sure this is quite right. Of course, American-born children of deportees face all kinds of difficulties, but wouldn't their American citizenship, when they come of age, nonetheless serve as a valuable resource? Secondly, and lastly, does the proliferation of strategically acquired dual citizenship really herald the rise of the sovereign individual, as Yossi argues in his conclusion? Yes, like many other statuses that were once ascribed and are now at least in part achieved, one thinks of religion, language, ethnicity, race, gender, or sex, citizenship too is increasingly open to choice and change. Yet, as Yossi notes in his presentation and in the book, while the number of dual citizens is large in absolute terms, they remain a small minority, 2% by his calculation. Dual citizenship and the conditions under which individuals can take advantage of it depends on state policies. States can tolerate a certain amount of strategic behavior with respect to citizenship, but they can also change the rules if that behavior is perceived as damaging to state interests. Yossi mentions the ways in which the US has begun to aggressively seek to tax the global income of US citizens, leading many Americans living abroad to renounce their citizenship. And as he notes, we may be likely to see more suspicion toward dual citizenship, both from governments and from populist movements. I don't foresee any major resacralization of citizenship, but I do wonder to what extent it's warranted to speak of the rise of the sovereign individual. I'll stop here. The book is full of interesting observations and arguments, and there's lots more we could talk about, but this should be enough to get us started. Okay, terrific. So thank you so much for a, 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 a such a uh, sparkling comment. So uh, Yossi, do you want to quickly respond and then we can open up to the uh, audience? Sure, uh, five minutes or 10 minutes. Uh... Take the time you need. Okay. So uh, thank you so much, Rogers, for uh, this careful reading of the book and, and for uh, raising very, uh, very interesting uh, points and questions. I'm going to try and be very brief because I also want to open up for questions. Uh, so um, the first point that, that you raised is that um, the, um, the Hungarian case is less instrumental, is less clearly instrumental relative to the other cases. And I would definitely uh, agree on that. I, I agree with you on that uh, point. One, uh, and, and you, you mentioned uh, Sabolj Pogoni's research, which uh, shows this. Um, I, I'll say uh, two things, two very quick things about this. First of all, it is actually possible to, uh, I mean, one of the interesting ways in which uh, uh, the instrumental and the practical motivations can, can, they can coexist within the same uh, family. For example, um, you have in, in general, the older people were uh, much more sentimental and, and uh, had a much more expressive interest in Hungarian citizenship and the younger people were more instrumental. But often these people were um, in the same uh, family and applying uh, together. So you had, motiva you had applications that were often triggered by the instrumental motivations of the younger generation, and then the older people went along uh, and their motivation was mostly uh, sentimental. But um, of course, it's, it's, uh, it's very clearly much less uh, directly transactional and uh, instrumental as in the Israeli and Mexican uh, cases and about um, Romania. So um, yeah, it, it uh, Again, this case does not fall, fall completely within the uh, global uh, hierarchy. About um, the, uh, the point you make about uh, Israel and Mexico. So is it truly a global upward mobility or is it more um, a, a local uh, strategy of elite consolidation? So I would say that, that it is both. And basically what, my, uh, what I found through this uh, study is to what degree um, outward uh, global ties are crucial to social stratification, especially in, in uh, countries that are not uh, first uh, tier. So countries that are middle tier or uh, third tier countries 
having some ties to uh, Europe or to the US, and these can be uh, ties of uh, tourism, consumption, education, origin, uh, the citizenship. Uh, this is a really crucial part of the uh, social stratification. Uh, and, and this also explains the very strong uh, status aspect of dual citizenship uh, in both these uh, cases. So I, I would say that um, it, is, uh, it is both. Uh, and the, uh, you mentioned uh, Americans who might now be uh, already be more interested in getting dual citizenship, actually have statistics on uh, US Jews. Uh, getting interested in uh, German citizenship, and you see the rise in interest uh, after 2008. Uh, and uh, with the Trump, there is even gr uh, greater interest in ancestry based dual citizenship. I would say this does fit within the framework because it shows the relationship between uh, value of one's own citizenship and interest in dual citizenship. So uh, it is a response to a uh, devaluation of one's own citizenship. Um, about the, uh, okay, and, and I'll skip the, the Mexican uh, question for now, and just about your uh, last point, does the proliferation of dual citizenship, citizenship herald uh, the rise of a sovereign uh, uh, citizen? So, um, yeah, I, I agree that the sovereignty, the, the sovereign citizen kind of describes the subjective aspect. The uh, ability to uh, impose restrictions on citizenship remains in the hands of the state. And, and we have seen the U.S. get much tougher on uh, tax obligations, and people have been giving up their citizenship. In Europe and Canada, what has been going on, uh, another related development is since the, uh, in response to the terrorist attacks of the last couple of years, these countries have renewed citizenship stripping, which, which targets uh, specifically dual citizens, because uh, there is a global norm that you cannot leave a person without any citizenship. So this is another attack on the sovereignty of the dual citizen. So uh, definitely uh, the idea was to highlight the subjective aspect and the new perception of the relations uh, between the individual and the state, not the actual legal reality, which remains very clearly tilted in, in favor of the state. Okay. Okay. Um, Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. So let's begin with a uh, question uh, from uh, uh, David Abraham, who asks that, uh, he suggests that we should consider that state neo-mercantilism is compatible with the trend that you have been describing. For example, Israel and China no longer consider emigrants or dual nationals as deserters or losers, but rather as assets deployed abroad uh, as some kind of a transnational network. So to what extent does this shift, uh, is this consistent with the trend that you've been describing? Um, could, could one think yeah, of it? Yeah, absolutely. So, mm -hmm. go ahead. So, so um, yeah. So um, again, I'm speaking in very, very broad terms. I'm making very broad generalizations. But uh, in general, uh, you could say that. Um, wait. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in general, you can say that uh, there has been since the end of the Cold War and the the, the processes that that are usually called globalization. Uh, the perception of the individual is, is much less focused on uh, security and much more focused on the potential uh, economic uh, benefits that can uh, derive to the uh, uh, economy and to the uh, state. Uh, and uh, from that perspective, dual citizens switch from being a suspect category when viewed from the security perspective and become actually a beneficial category. So this explains the, the shift towards embracing uh, diasporas, which you see in uh, many countries. You, can, you see it very strongly in countries that are uh, relatively uh, low income and where the diasporas already had a big financial uh, say and they've been pushing for dual citizenship. But even in countries uh, that where the diaspora is not so strong, these countries are actively harnessing the diaspora. So the rise of dual citizenship is definitely uh, related to that. Okay, terrific. We have a hand raised by David Jacobson. David, do you want to uh, pose your question? Okay, I'm not certain whether he's still on or, or whether we have a technical problem. So let me ask a question. Uh, no, right. Can you hear me oh, now? Go ahead, David. Great. Okay. So yeah, no, I wanted to ask Yossi. Uh, so you you um, you're looking at the problem of the level of the individual 
and, and in a very interesting way. But my question sort of complements Roger's, uh, somewhat complements some of Roger's comments, which is the, is the linkage to institutions. Uh, and this, I think, if you can get to the question of institutions, you can get to the larger implications of what you're describing beyond this population of two or three percent. So I'll make one comment and, and follow with a question. So the comment is that, you know, if we look at the, the uh, emergence of dual citizenship as a legal phenomenon uh, in the mid to late 1990s, uh, particularly in the European Union and Europe generally, what we are seeing is its emergence uh, in the context of human rights. And so if you look at changes in EU law about nationality, the language is very idealistic, actually. I, it's, it's true that in countries like Turkey and in Mexico, it quickly becomes more strategic on, an, on a government level as well as an individual level. And I think that if um, you consider that, aspect of it, then we can begin to see, you know, how uh, one aspect of how it begins to tie up institutionally. And in your own presentation, you talk of the language of some of these dual citizens as the right to pick the most beneficial uh, citizenship, language of restitution, uh, notions of shifting from an ascribed status to an achievement status. Uh, all this you know, all this resonates in terms of this human rights language, which can, in a barbarian sense, have affinity with the commodification you're talking about, that legally, uh, institutionally is distinct from this individual level you're describing about, and I think can contextualize the idea of the sovereign individual, because all of this is happening in different institutional contexts. And my question would be, how changes citizenship itself beyond the two or three percent of people you're talking about who may have this very instrumental strategic view? And if, to, to put it very simply, if we view citizenship in some, I don't know if traditional is the right word, but in, in some more conventional sense as dealing with uh, issues of, you know, the horizontal issues of community integration, etc., uh, and the vertical issues of civic politics, uh, of the relationship of rulers and ruled, uh, how this changes citizenship itself in that sense. And again, pushing for the institutional beyond the views of the individuals themselves, uh, I think can also um, draw out further uh, the implications of what you're describing. Okay, thank you. I'll stop there. Thank you. So, so you actually raised a lot of uh, interesting points and I cannot uh, um, say something about each of them, but I'll mention uh, two things that relate to the points that you raised. Uh, first of all, the, uh, the, the connection to uh, human rights uh, is definitely, uh, this is, there is a strong connection. Actually, the, the, or I, I use this term uh, sovereign individual as a paraphrase of a term that uh, Patrick Vine has, uh, has uh, used. Uh, in his book about the uh, toleration of dual citizenship in the U.S., where the, uh, the U.S. used to strip citizenship of uh, people who emigrated or who uh, voted in other countries. Uh, and there is a, a Supreme Court uh, ruling from 1967, Freud versus Rusk, where uh, the, um, the Supreme Court of the U.S. Um, sets down this principle that, the, that you cannot strip people of their citizenship because people are part of the, each individual citizen is uh, in fact um, holds sovereignty. So um, this concept is actually a legal concept in the US that as Patrick Weil calls it, the sovereign uh, citizen. So in Europe, it comes from a different tradition of, of human rights, but um, th there is um, certainly this element, but I would say that when you look at the actual decisions that governments make, I would say that these, um, setting the US aside for now, I would say that uh, the human rights principles, they create an environment in which it is uh, more legitimate to come up with dual citizenship legisl legislation. When you look at actual countries and actual governments and the decisions that they make, they are almost always uh, strategic, they might have very different goals. They might be about uh, integrating immigrants, including uh, immigrants, getting voters. This is a major consideration, but the, the human rights is often a kind of um, uh, legal environment. 
Uh, and about your uh, second point is about how does this change in citizenship sh change the, uh, our traditional understanding of citizenship as a horizontal, um, equal, egalitarian uh, principle of uh, belonging. And I think one of the interesting uh, things that, that um, uh, emerge when you have a population of dual citizens, and especially when you have dual citizens who are already priv privileged, and yet another citizenship that privileges them even more, is that some of the uh, imagined unity of nations comes into question. So um, uh, if you are European origin Israeli or a Mexican or uh, a Brazilian, you can you are already privileged and you can convert this privilege into an actual uh, set of concrete rights from a European uh, country. So in this sense, uh, this um, potentially and or if you are uh, so richer elites are much more likely to be able to acquire US citizenship through strategic birth or an investment visa and so on. So this does create the, the potential for um, uh, undermining this horizontal uh, unity. Okay, terrific, thank you. A uh, question from James Lauke. How might dual citizenship energize efforts to go beyond place of birth as the most significant criteria for legitimacy? Do indigenous efforts to develop and use passports provide insights? I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the. Uh... All right. I don't know, James. If you want to, uh, if you want to to elaborate, if you're still on, let's wait a moment. All right. You can come back on, James. Just send me a chat. Let me ask you another question. Let me ask another question from Perry Bloom. Isn't it important to recognize that an individual can have strong ties or a strong relationship with more than one country, even if they only have citizenship in a single country? Why are you treating citizenship as a bright line distinction? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thanks. That, that's a great question. So um, one of the interesting things that I that I found in my uh, research is actually that. Um, so we have this image, you know, if we just like ask a lay person to imagine a person who has dual citizenship, the image would be someone who is, um, uh, what is it called, like third culture kid, right? Would be someone who belongs to uh, two cultures in a relatively full way uh, and, and um, uh, maybe Mexican and American or um, Algerian and French and so on. But uh, w what I found was that um, there, a lot of people who are actually, and uh, in a very concrete sense, hold two um, identities, even you could say even two national identities, people who are second generation immigrants who have a very strong uh, origin country identity. Uh, many of them uh, would not hold dual citizenship. And in contrast, a large percentage of people who are formally dual citizens are actually, uh, actually feel uh, just like mono nationals. There, there is actually people who are, uh, in the cases we talked about, Mexicans who just happened to be born in the US but grew up their entire lives in Mexico, or Israelis whose grandparents happened to come from Poland, but they're Israeli and their uh, parents are Israeli. So these people are formally dual citizens, but um, in terms of identity, have very clear one national identity, whereas many people who are really binational uh, in terms of their culture and identity uh, do not have dual citizenship and may not be eligible for that. So I would really stress the, the differentiation. So okay, in this me, sense, to, yeah. Okay, let me try. To to, your, just one last sentence. Sure, of course. So, so citizenship is a, bright, is a bright boundary because it's a legal category as uh, Rogers has, uh, has written about. Uh, so citizenship is, it's a binary legal category with very clear distinctions between citizens and non-citizens. Okay, let, let me pose James Lauke's question one more time with some further elaboration. So he asked initially, how might dual citizenship energize efforts to go beyond place of birth 
as the most significant criteria for legitimacy. And uh, he then elaborates, I'm concerned about how place of birth has become the single most, criter most critical criterion uh, for, uh, for rights, including the right to move, which is so fundamental to being human and therefore to human rights. Okay. So, um, first of all, a place of birth is just one of the principles. And as, um, again, as, as Rogers uh, wrote about in his uh, seminal uh, book, we have these two main principles. And uh, actually, the more common principle is based on uh, parents' citizenship rather than the individual's uh, place, of, uh, place of birth. Uh, about the second point about the right to move, so I would uh, definitely uh, agree that there have been growing arguments among citizenship scholars, uh, most notably uh, Dmitry Kochanov, that um, the, the most fundamental right of citizenship, the, the, the most fundamental core aspect of citizenship today should not be seen necessarily as uh, civil rights or social rights or political rights in the, the way that T.H. Uh, Marshall has wrote about this, but about the territorial rights, about the right of abode, the right to enter a territory, the right to be present in a territory and not to be deported. So um, I would definitely agree that these have become core uh, aspects of citizenship, however way it is allocated. Okay, um, a, a background question. Why do Romanians want Hungarian citizenship? Oh, because they are ethnically, uh, they are ethnically uh, Hungarian. They're uh, a minority that, um, it's, uh, so uh, Sabolj Pogoni, who studied this, um, his main argument, and maybe uh, Roger's actually done his own research about Hungarians in Romania, so he knows a lot more about this uh, than I do. But um, in, in Sabolj's book, the main point would be uh, I would say uh, status. So in a sense of uh, express, both expressing their Hungarian identity and uh, not feeling like a second class uh, um, minority uh, ethnics compared to the Romanian majority. Okay, but an elaboration, but they, they are both EU, EU members. So what is the benefit, Hannah writes? Yeah, like I said, the benefit is, is international. It, it is within the nation. It gives yeah. the, the members of a minority that is uh, um, discriminated in a sense, uh, it, it gives them equal status and it gives them an opportunity to express their uh, identity as Hungarians. It, it, it gives them a sense of historical uh, justice because they, they can belong to uh, Hungary, which many of them would uh, prefer over belonging to Romania. Okay, a question from Irina Levin. I was wondering whether you see a link between states' attempts to assert their sovereignty and citizens' efforts to do so. That is, how, how, is indi how are individuals' desire for dual citizenship driven by state behavior around borders, territorial integrity, deportation, denationalization, etc.? How is individuals' desire for the so is there a link between the individual strategies you describe in their book and states' efforts to assert their sovereignty? Right. So, so basically the, the story that, that is going on, the story that I'm trying to tell, is uh, a story that has a lot of unintended consequences. So countries, governments, to be more precise, they come up with these uh, citizenship uh, uh, schemes uh, and uh, individuals strategically try to find um, loopholes that can be beneficial to them or uh, try to, uh, if these uh, programs create risks for them, they try to mitigate those, uh, those risks. Um, so, um, um, I mean, these, I would say that these aspects are just closely uh, Closely connected, but I think one of the um, let me read the question. Can you be more specific? I mean, I can you have a specific example in mind? I don't know. Let's see whether Irena, if you are on the uh, if you can if you can uh, you're still on uh, in the webinar. If you can uh, elaborate. 
this is the awkwardness of uh, these remote sessions. Hi. Uh, oh, great. You can hear me. Um, I guess I was, you know, uh, I, I feel like the, the focus uh, in the book from, from what I've heard now, um, I, I look forward to reading it, but I haven't yet, um, is on kind of elites um, and their strategic use of it. And as I think that, you know, when we talk about elites being strategic, we, we know that that's very different when we talk from when we talk about people who are seen as, you know, vulnerable and, and certainly not elite as being strategic. So I was wondering, I guess for both of those, you know, the, the populations that you focused on, you know, how you see their efforts to get this as an insurance policy or as a gift or as a way to maximize potential um, as being a response to the way that, that states are kind of, you know, implementing their sovereignty, whether that is just around, like I said, is around borders or, or trying to really assert territorial integrity, um, deport populations, um, denationalize popula populations. So this question of whether, you know, I, I think individuals see states acting, you know, kind of robustly around their sovereignty and they feel like they're sort of forced into a situation where they have to act pretty strategically around their individual sovereignty as well. It's kind of what I was trying to get at. Okay. Um, yeah, so, I mean, the, the, the basic, um, the basic situation is, is um, uh, that states and governments create the, uh, the, the framework and the kind of very um, powerful um, set of circumstances within which ind individuals can uh, operate and uh, individuals strategically uh, operate within those. And this is uh, to a large extent uh, conditioned on their uh, level of uh, know-how and uh, their connections, and uh, it, it depends a lot on the resources that they already uh, have. Uh, for example, um, uh, Rogers uh, mentioned the uh, uh, cases of this. So we have the two cases of uh, dual US dual nationals in, uh, in Mexico. We have these uh, elite individuals whose parents give birth to them deliberately. They go, to, they, they go to the US, they give birth, they already know exactly what they're going to do. They get the birth certificate, then they go and get the passport, then they register uh, their Mexican citizenship in the Mexican consulate in the, in the city where they just gave birth. Then they return to Mexico with both citizenships completely uh, sorted out. Uh, in contrast, these uh, children of deportees, so these are US born children of Mexican immigrants who are uh, undocumented in the US and then got deported. So they usually did not register their uh, children as um, Mexicans when they are uh, born in the US. And this is what explains the, the kind of, uh, um, so if they get deported, they follow, if the parents get deported, the children follow them and they don't have um, the Mexican citizenship, which puts them as, at a disadvantage and it's hard for them to prove their American citizenship. So you just see a huge gap in terms of the bu bureaucratic uh, know-how of these uh, uh, populations of upper class and working class uh, Mexicans. So this is just one example of the way that uh, people are, um, their degree of flexibility, their degree, the, the, the possibility of strategic behavior vis-a-vis -vis, uh, states depends on their pre-existing uh, resources and education, but also on brokers that actually, that actively inform people of what they might, uh, what they might do. Okay. All right. Terrific. So I think this is probably the time to bring our session to a close. I do want to very much thank our two speakers, Yossi Harpaz and Rogers Bruberg. I want to note that they are speaking to us from the other side of the Atlantic, Rogers in Germany, Yossi in Israel. And so I want to thank them for being willing to share their Friday evening uh, with uh, us uh, in Los Angeles and elsewhere in the United States. Thank you, of course, to everyone who has joined us for this event. I want to remind you that we will meet at the same time, same place uh, next Friday for a discussion of a book by Shoba Wadhya, Banned Immigration Enforcement in the Time of Trump. So thanks to our speakers. 
thanks to colleagues and friends at CCIS who are partnering with us in this adventure, and thanks to the audience. Have a great weekend. Uh, perhaps by next Friday, we'll have good news about our US election. And until then, all the best. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you, Roger, and thanks, everyone.